Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers and, um, for inviting me to this conference. <coughs> and uh, I, especially to uh, Pietro for organizing this session. Uh, I, as Mario said, I'm a philosopher, so I am going to in, uh, engage with these questions at a, a stratospheric level of abstraction. Um, but I hope that's kind of nice for the sort of postprandial experience. Um, my title is Why Intentionality is Not Really a Thing. And I, I mean that in the sense that I believe the children say, you know, the kids these days, they say, oh, is that still a thing? You know, what I mean is, I think intentionality isn't still a thing. This is a, in, in a certain sense, which I'm now going to make more precise. Um, but first of all, I want to start by introducing this topic. Why are we talking about intentionality here? Intentionality here in this sense is the, uh, the, the, con the philosophical term and concept with a long history going back to scholastic philosophy, which means mental representation. So um, I sympathized with Alex um, yesterday, Alex Byrne, when he said that he would like to be in charge of philosophical terminology. Um, in fact, we should, perhaps we should have an international congress determining um, the standard units of philosophical terminology because then we wouldn't get confused about things. But intentionality in this sense is not to do with intention and intentional action. It's, it simply means mental representation. Um, and that's just a stipulation on my part. Uh, but what has intentionality in this sense got to do with consciousness? Um, here we are on the, towards the science of consciousness, and if that's the direction we want to go in, then um, why are we talking about intentionality? What's it got to do with the science of consciousness? Um, <clears throat> my questions today, uh, are going to, I'm going to hopefully answer those two questions. Um, by looking briefly at the relationship between consciousness and intentionality as conceived in recent um, in philosophy and, and, and theoretical um, um, science generally. Um, and then I'm going to look, look at the question of whether consciousness can be explained in terms of intentionality. Uh, I'm going to approach that um, in, in what I think is perhaps a rather unorthodox way. Um, by denying that intentionality is a thing. Um, and then I'm going to look finally at the implication for, of my, those answers to those two questions um, to the hard problem. Um, so, intentionality and consciousness, um, I think these days it's possible to distinguish three approaches to um, how to think about the relationship between those things, between mental representation and consciousness. Um, one is what we could call separation or separatism, where you think of intention, intentionality and consciousness as separate things. They're essentially, they may be contingently connected, but conceptually, necess necessarily, or nomologically, they're not connected. <coughs> um, this would be a view, for example, that saw all intentionality, uh, all mental representation as essentially unconscious, and, or, and the essence of consciousness being not essentially intentional. Um, this, that latter idea is where the notion of qualia belongs. Uh, but there's another view, which is intentionalism, which is held by certain people in, in this room, um, which is the view that you should explain consciousness in terms of intentionality. That is to say, you should explain consciousness in terms of mental representation. There are various forms of that. Dave has written um, illuminatingly about this, so has Alex, Alex Byrne. Um, and... Um, this has been a, an active kind of idea in, in, in the philosophy of mind for some decades. Um, a more recent idea that's come up is the other way around. Phenomenal intentionality, as it's called, is a, is a view that tries to explain intentionality in terms of consciousness. So it's the other way around. So people who believe in this doctrine of phenomenal intentionality, like An Angela Mendelovici, for example, they think that there is an independent notion of the phenomenal, phenomenal consciousness, and you explain the, the intentional connection to reality in terms of that. I'm not going to be talking about that view here. And I'm not going to be talking about separation. I'm going to be talking about intentionalism. <coughs> now, intentionalists are typically naturalistic. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it's a very, very vague term. It doesn't really have a strict definition. Um, so we can say, we, but we can put some kind of constraints on it. Um, we can ex it, here, here's one thing that, in, that naturalistic theories of consciousness think you should be trying to do, which is to explain consciousness in terms of natural science. I should say naturalism is opposed to other kinds of philosophy. If um, there's a broad distinction we can make between 
naturalistic philosophy which thinks that the things that we already know are relevant to our philosophical endeavors. So we're allowed to, we're allowed to illuminate philosoph philosophical questions by appealing to things we already know, facts, scientific and other facts. Uh, there's another kind of philosophy, we could call it transcendental philosophy, which asks about the conditions of the possibility of anything. Um, and for such a transcendental philosophy, uh, you don't start by saying what you already know, but you start by trying to somehow lay the foundations of all questions by asking about their what makes them possible. So I distinguish between naturalistic philosophy and, and transcendental philosophy. I'm, um, I'm, and for example, those who know a little bit about the history of philosophy would, you know, this would, this is, a, I see this as part of the distinction between German philosophy and Austrian philosophy. Austrian philosophy, are tip, Austrian philosophers like Brentano and, and, and Freud and, um, and the Vienna Circle um, and Karl Popper, for example, um, begin with what we already know. German philosophy begins with the question of how is anything possible überhaupt? This is the kind of German approach. So, so this is a useful way, way of dramatizing the history of philosophy. Um, the aim here is to show how consciousness can be a natural phenomenon um, and intentionalists have tended to do this by attempting a reductive account of intentionality. So, intention so here's one intentionalist approach. It isn't mine, but it's one inter dominant intentionalist approach that says you explain consciousness in terms of intentionality, mental representation, then you explain mental representation in terms of something more naturalistically respectable, like causal correlation with the environment or something like this. So that all seems very clear, except that it hasn't worked. Um, and when I say it hasn't worked, like everything in this talk, that's an exaggeration. But you know, my, my own, as part of my philosophical methodology, is that philosophy begins not with wonder, but with exaggeration. And the very first philosopher that we recognize coming from this part of the world was, of course, um, Thales or Thales. Uh, and he said that everything is water. He was wrong. He was exaggerating. Not everything is water. Some things are water, some things aren't. Right? And when Marx said, the whole history of the, the world is being, can be explained in terms of class struggle. He was wrong. He was exaggerating. So all philosophy involves an exaggeration, including this talk. Right? So I say the, the reduction of intentionality hasn't worked, um, and neither has a, the reductionist um, account of consciousness, um, a fortiori. Um, why? Um, so there are, many, there are many reasons, and there are many arguments, and there are many detailed arguments for and against. Here, in the, in the half an hour that I've allotted myself, I'm not going to give any detailed arguments for or against, or detailed arguments for anything. I'm going to make a, a large number of assertions, which I hope will paint a picture, which then the detailed arguments could come later. I'm going to say something different. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to talk about the usual reasons why people think reduction of intentionality hasn't worked. Um, I'm, I'm going to say intentionally hasn't Intention, the reduction of intention hasn't worked because, in a sense, intentionality is not a thing. I mean, in a sense, it's not a property, it's not a capacity of things, it's not a relation, it's not a thing which can be explained. So if you think of the classic example in, in philosophy of science of reduction, theoretical reduction, going back to, to Ernest Nagel's book, The Structure of Science, from the 1960s. Um, there, the example was the reduction of temperature, or rather the reduction of thermodynamics to to um, statistical mechanics. And this is the, so you explain the truths of thermodynamics in mechanical terms. Um, there it's taken for granted that there is such a thing as temperature, and you're explaining it in terms of these things, in terms of you know, um, matter in motion, basically. Intentionality isn't like that. It's not really a property of mental phenomena that they're intentional. It's a way of classifying together um, many disparate kinds of mental phenomena. Um, in one sense, a property, of course, it's a property, but it's not a natural phenomenon which you, you can give a natural explanation of, intentionality as such. Uh, and this is going to be one of my points today. Um, so in this sense, there isn't a thing to be reduced uh, by the reductionist. Uh, mental representation, there isn't a common phenomenon of mental representation, which is common to all these um, mental um, uh, categories or um, mental faculties that I'm going to talk about, there isn't one common thing for which you can get, say, you know, X represents Y if and only if, and then you give a philosopher's definition. Um, that's the wrong way to think about it, I'm going to say. Um, 
By comparison, this is a comparison for philosophers only, so everyone else can go to sleep for one minute. Um, to, to get across what I mean, um, Mariology is the, the theory of parts and wholes. Um, is there such a thing as the relationship between a whole and its parts? Uh, Mariologists say yes, there is, and then they give it a formal definition. So they think there's a formal account that applies to anything, no matter what, to chairs, to organisms, to motor cars, to the universe, all these things, the whole stand in part-whole relations. Now my view is that that's not, that's, um, that's incorrect. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. It gets you into all sorts of paradoxes. Um, instead, what you should say is, you know, how do the parts of something fit together? And you say, well, what kind of thing? You say, well, for example, a human body. You, know, you say, well, the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone, the hip bone's connected to the chest bone, or whatever. And, and you tell how all the parts of the human body are, co are connected. Once you've done that, there's no further question, which is, and by the way, in what meriological relation do they stand? Once you said how the parts of any individual thing are connected in the way that that thing is built up, there isn't a further question about, the, about um, whether, for example, a whole is more than some of its parts or whether the meriological part-whole relation holds on top of these other relations. Now, this is what I want to say about intentionality, a similar thing. So how does that leave naturalizing consciousness? If you're an intentionalist, what should you say about naturalizing consciousness? Um, I think you start with these two questions, um, step by step. Um, first of all, you need a conceptual framework. And this is one of the things I think which has been crucial in this conference, you can see. We need a conceptual framework for the phenomena which harmonizes with natural science. It's not just enough that it's consistent with it, it has to harmonize in, with it. Um, and second, then we ask ourselves, where does consciousness fit in to that framework? What sort of concept? Where, where does it belong in the conceptual framework? Um, and then we will ask the question, how is consciousness embodied in, in, in the brains and bodies of living organisms? My only constraint is that we shouldn't make things up. We shouldn't just invent theories off the top of our head, I mean, as philosophers. Um, uh, unconstrained by the, by the empirical facts. Um, so I, I quote Newton and I say, hypotheses non fingo. Right? I'm not making any hypotheses about consciousness and how it's, how, uh, how it's constructed from my a priori position of, 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 uh, in the armchair. Right? That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is fitting the concept of consciousness into a conceptual framework, which then would make it amenable to naturalistic reduction. So that's because I'm a naturalistic philosopher, not a transcendental philosopher. Um, so that's, I, I don't think we should be in the business of inventing a priori theories of consciousness. So what is this conceptual framework I'm talking about? Uh, and now I will introduce it without just as a just description. Um, and if anyone has questions about it, we can answer them later. I say we often talk about mental states, mental processes, mental events, and things like this. There are some famous papers. There's a famous paper by Donald Davidson called Mental Events. Um, People talk about mental properties, like believing something, or being conscious of a banana, or being conscious of a red square, or perceiving that P. And these, these are all these examples of states or processes that we talk about in, in, in philosophy. Um, but I don't think we should start from there. Um, I think we should start instead with the idea of a, a mental capacity. Um, and I think this harmonizes more with, actual, with what, what our psychologists think about this. Uh, in a psychology textbook, this is a superficial point, but it indicates something. In a psychology textbook, you don't get a, you don't get a list of mental states. Here are all the mental states we're going to look at. You get chapters like memory, perception, um, imagination, language. These are the things that we start with what we're trying to explain. These are our explananda if we're naturalistic philosophers. We start with the capacities. These are capacities of organisms. Memory, perception, language, sensation, imagination, reasoning, agency. These are, now, which capacities they are is an empirical question, but here are some which have been constants throughout the study of psychology. So don't start with mental states, processes, events. Nothing wrong with those notions, but don't start there. Start with the idea of, of, um, uh, of a mental capacity. Um, 
So I say, these are capacities of organisms, these are the explananda. Um, so by saying they're capacities of organisms, then I'm restricting what I'm calling the explanation of consciousness to the explanation of things that we already know are conscious. Uh, so I say, we're allowed to appeal to things we already know. I know that all of you are conscious. I know that many animals are conscious. This was questioned this morning, but I think, it, I think that question has a different meaning. Uh, we know that dogs and, 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 and many, many, many other animals are conscious. We know that. Um, so we're allowed to start with that. Let's not start by asking, what is it about physical matter that makes it conscious? Then you end up in a different kind of direction. If you're asking about the physical world in general, um, then you'll end up with, with questions about um, materialism, physicalism, um, and even um, panpsychism. And you might end up with the conclusion that the smallest particles have some grain of consciousness. I don't want to go there. I'm starting with what we know. We know that these things are conscious, so let's try and understand those. Organisms. Similarly, I don't, at this point, and this, I'm not saying that this isn't a question, but at this point I'm not saying how you could build something that's conscious. Uh, or, so whether any AI is conscious, for example. I'm just talking about organisms, things that we know are conscious already, and start with that. Now, these mental capacities I'm talking about, by capacity of something, I mean, um, I mean something like um, um, you know, the capacity for digestion, um, the capacity for locomotion, um, the capacity that the, that the body has to, to, to pump blood around, around itself, um, but also the mental capacities, the capacity for thinking, the capacity for reasoning, perceiving, imagining, and so on capacity to feel things in your body. Um, these are capacities of, of the organism. Which, why are they mental? And my hypothesis that I've defended before is that they're mental because they are intentional. They all involve the mind's direction upon an object, as Brentano said. They all have an object. Or rather, their exercises all have objects. So if you think you have the capacity for vision, and you have that capacity even when you're asleep and your eyes are closed, when you exercise that capacity, then uh, your state of mind has an object. Intentionality is not a capacity. This is, this is why I say it's not a thing. It's not the thing that needs to be reduced. The capacities are the things that need to be explained, not intentionality. So there's a distinction here between a capacity and its exercises, just as if you have the capacity to play baseball, uh, you, you can exercise that capacity in different occasions. The exercise of a capacity is an event. That's where events fit in something that happens, that's the exercise of a capacity. The process can also be an exercise of a capacity, it's a similar thing to an event. The upshot of a capacity may be a state. So if you think of the classic sort of functionalist picture in the philosophy of mind, you perceive something and you form a belief about it. The belief you form is a state, it's a persisting state, it's not an event. Uh, now, these, if you're not interested or familiar with these distinctions, then you can completely ignore what I just said. It's important to for some ph philosophical reasons. What about consciousness? Where does consciousness fit in? If intentionality is not a thing, is consciousness a thing? So this is my claim, that some exercises of mental capacities are conscious and some are not. That seems to me to be a fact, right? Unconscious processing can be an exercise of mental capacities. Uh, unconscious reasoning, unconscious inference is an exercise of a mental capacity, but it's not conscious. Your exercise of your visual capacity or your capacity to to, to feel pain, it results in conscious, conscious exercises. So visual experience, imagining, dreaming, and so on, feeling pain, these are, these are conscious exercises of mental capacities. How should this be explained? Um, so here, I think, I, I wasn't at um, Anil's talk, but from what people were saying, uh, there may be some similarities between what I want to say and what Anil wants to say. Um, consciousness, I want to say, is a property of exercises of some mental capacities. That's where it fits into the conceptual framework. Um, these capacities can have an evolutionary explanation. So I'm not committing myself to that, but, but, but I'm not committing myself to the denial of it either. It's, it's incredibly plausible that many of our mental capacities have an evolutionary explanation, even if we can never know what, that, what the real explanation is. The capacity to feel pain for example, has been discussed a lot. The evolution of language has been discussed. Or they may have a functional explanation. 
Um, or they may have a mechanistic explanation if, if that's something different from a functional explanation. And so there are, there are these various familiar kinds of explanation. I mean mechanism here in the sense of Bechtel and, and Machama and um, Craver, that, in that sense of mechanism. Um, so there are various familiar kinds of explanation, and we can try and explain these capacities in terms of them. Um, that raises the question whether consciousness is a single thing. If we're, just, we're looking for individual explanations of mental capacities, will we have one single explanation of consciousness? Um, the explanation of consciousness, I think, will consist in the answers to the question, these questions, right? How do these capacities and their, with conscious exercises work? How does vision work? How did it come about? These are the questions we're trying to answer. This does not presuppose that consciousness is realized in the same way in all the different capacities. So it doesn't mean that there is one thing um, that is consciousness. Uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't mean that there isn't one thing. This would be compatible with global workspace or attentional theories of consciousness. Um, but it's not, it's not a commitment for the idea of, of the explanation of, of, of consciousness in this framework that you have to have the same explanation for all mental capacities. Um, but, someone might say, it's the hard problem, stupid. What about the hard problem? Are these, are these explanations I'm gesturing towards, which I haven't obviously offered any explanations, but I'm, I'm gesturing in a direction with which I hope you're all familiar. Are these explanations just um, solving the easy problems of consciousness in, in Dave's famous formulation? Well, some might say, yes, they're solving the easy problems, but they don't get anywhere with the hard problem. That's true. I, s I agree. That's true. So then my final point is going to be about what we should say about the hard problem, given what I've just said about the actual naturalistic explanation of consciousness. So what is the hard problem? Um, we should all pay tribute to Thomas Nagel. This paper has been frequently criticized, uh, but it's an absolute masterpiece. It's what's it like to be a bat. It contains pretty much all the, all the um, discussion of consciousness in the last 50 years is contained within those 15 pages, like, 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 like a plant within a seed. Um, Nagel says, for example, we may call this the subject, subjective character of experience. It's not captured by any of the familiar, recently devised reductive analyses of the mental, for all of them are logically compatible with its absence. Logically compatible with its absence. That idea is Dave's idea of a zombie. Um, this is a dramatization of Nagel's point. Now, of course, they're very different. Nagel assumes materialism in that paper, and Dave uses a zombie to argue against materialism, in employing extra premises. But that basic idea that all these capacities and their exercises could be there, even if the thing was not conscious, is um, uh, the starting point of, um, of Nagel's paper, and it's also um, dramatized in Dave's idea of a zombie. And then there's the question of whether zombies are conceivable. Uh, is this really conceivable? It seems to me it is, in a certain sense. Because for any account of a particular kind of conscious phenomenon, we can imagine that account being true of an organism without that organism being conscious. We can imagine it. If we can't imagine it, then we can't imagine a certain epistemological scenario in philosophy, which is what's known as the problem of other minds. I can ask myself, how do I know that any of you have minds? I've, I said earlier on that I know you're all conscious, and, I'm, and nothing could persuade me that you're not. Nothing could persuade me that I am the only conscious thing in the world. Absolutely nothing. Nothing could persuade me that these chairs are conscious. Um, but the, the skeptical question is, how do you know, given your evidence? That's what skepticism is. Skepticism is a, is a part of epistemology. It's not part of the theory of mind. It's not part of the theory of the world. It's part of a theory of knowledge, how we justify our beliefs. That's what it is. Um, so I think this is the problem of other minds is coherent. How do I know that people have minds? That's a coherent question. So in some sense, I can imagine this. And I, I, perhaps I could say one thing about the sense. When I imagine this, I don't have to fill in all the details. 
when you imagine a skeptical scenario in general, you don't have to fill in all the details. Um, if someone says to me, uh, how do you know that the whole world isn't an illusion and just, you know, that all in fact you're experiencing are just a bunch of images on your retina? Um, it's not relevant to that to say, how could that have come about? No one could have done that, right? Or how do you know you're not a brain in a vat? You say, what do you mean a brain in a vat? You couldn't create a brain in a vat. That's not, you know, that's not relevant to the epistemological question. Um, you may think epistemology is a load of something, but you may think that, and that's your, you're perfectly entitled to that opinion, right? <laughs> but that's not relevant to what, to what we're talking about here in the philosophy of mind. There is an epistemological question, and the epistemologist can answer it. Right? If I say, you know, how do I know I'm not a brain in a vat? Um, and you say to me, tell me what the vat's like. What sort of stuff's in the vat? Or what is in the, uh, what, what, how big is your brain? Which bit of the brain? Do you put the whole spinal column in? Or how? You say, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, like Descartes said, how do I know I'm not being deceived by an evil demon? It's a completely irrelevant response to that to say, there aren't any demons. Demons don't exist. Next question. Right? That's irrelevant. In philosophy, we teach our students about these skeptical problems. That's not because we think there are demons or because we think that the world doesn't really exist. We're talking about how we justify our knowledge. That's the point. Okay. So I think skepticism about other minds is coherent, but so what? So why is that relevant to, to the investigation of consciousness? An analogy. Bertrand Russell said, there is no logical impossibility in the hypothesis that the world sprang into being five minutes ago exactly as it was with a population that remembered a wholly un unreal past. Nothing that is happening now it, or will happen in the future can disprove the hypothesis that the world began five minutes ago, Russell said. Classic statement of skepticism about the past, right? the skeptical challenge about the past. There's nothing in our experience that rules that out, he says. Now, physicists' speculations about the universe should not be governed by Rus Russell's skeptical assumption. They shouldn't have to accommodate that in their theory. They say, now I'm going to go to a conference where we're talking about the theory that the world was created five minutes ago. You know, you'd be laughed off the planet, right, if that, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't get your paper published or something. You wouldn't get tenure. Right? It's not relevant to the question of understanding the universe. So this is what I want to say about the zombie hypothesis. Why should we let the zombie hypothesis govern our speculations about consciousness? Now I know the answer, um, um, because I've been around the block in this, in this area, and the answer is to do with this doctrine of physicalism, but I don't want to discuss that. I haven't been talking about physicalism. I've been talking about naturalism, understanding consciousness naturalistically. And I think if we understand consciousness naturalistically, we should not let our, our um, speculations be governed by the zombie hypothesis and therefore we should not be bothered by the hard problem because the hard problem is only, uh, only really um, um, I think only makes sense if you take seriously something like the zombie hypothesis the, the, the intelligibility of the zombie hypothesis as a constraint on theorizing so that's my that was my controversial um, um, undefended claim about the hard problem, um, and um, let me just sum up then my conclusions. So I said that standard conceptions of intentionality and conscious, the, the intentionality consciousness connection, I think, are misconceived. Um, intentionality characterizes mental capacities, but it's not itself a capacity. So it's not something itself that needs to be explained. You don't need to give a reductive account of intentionality. You're allowed to take certain things for granted. You're allowed to take for granted the idea that the brain represents the world. Um, the explanation of consciousness should arise out of the explanation of mental capacities and their exercises, I say. But more controversially, I say that um, the mere possibility of zombies is irrelevant for this task. Um, so those are, those are my um, conclusions. I just want to end with a final thought, an image, which might um, help locate myself relative to some other lunatics. Um, it seems to me there are two ways of thinking about the idea of solving the problem of consciousness or explaining consciousness, broadly speaking. Of course, there are more than two ways. But here are two ways, two analogies you could use. One is solving the problem of consciousness is like putting a person on the moon. Um, 
You've got, you've got the rocket, you build the rocket, you put the person in it, you fire the rocket up and you get to the moon and you know when you've done it, when the guy has landed on the moon. Another possibility is it's more like finding a cure for cancer. Of course, in the popular press, everyone's talking about when will we ever find a cure for cancer. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that there are many cures. Well, there are many treatments. They may not say this is the cure for cancer, but there are many ways of making cancer disappear, many different kinds for different kinds of cancer. My view about naturalistic um, explanation of consciousness is that the latter is a better analogy than the former. Thanks very much. <laughs>